So, hello everyone, this is DJ. And Michal. And this is CG Talks, the podcast where CG guys talk about CG. And today's episode is a special episode because for the first time we are having a guest with us today. So it's not going to be just us three talking. I mean, there there will be three of us talking because, because Marco, unfortunately, is not with us today. He's sick. <laughs> Hang tight there, Marco. But today with us, we have a special guest and his name is Cheyenne Mondal. Did I pronounce it well? Yeah, that's perfect. Hello, guys. And Cheyenne is, uh, is a Blender artist and um, he has a YouTube channel as well. It's called Blue Inversion. So uh, maybe I'll let him introduce himself. So we'll say a few words yeah. about yourself. Firstly, uh, thank you so much, guys, for inviting me on this podcast. It's a really great honor for me. And yeah, uh, I started as a Blender artist and currently I'm experimenting with a few more softwares. But as of now, I'm using Blender as my primary software. I make a few tutorials here and there on uh, generally I'm trying to make long form tutorials right now. And I do sell some shader packs. And I am currently working on some add-ons. So the, those add-ons should be available by the end of this year, I think. So yeah, so that's my business. I call it Blue Inversion as a brand. So kind of keeping myself a little bit separated from the brand so that I can bring other people on maybe in the future. So yeah, so that's how we are going right now. I have a few plans, but this is the humble beginning, I guess. Well, yeah, I've, I've uh, generally had a, a pleasure of watching some of your tutorials on YouTube, and they seem to be performing pretty well, as you've uh, you've uh, had some nice performing uh, car modeling tutorial and uh, sneakers. Modeling yeah, tutorial. the car tutorial has been uh, really performing really nice. Actually, I didn't expect it to like. It has kind of on a very small scale. I can see it has blown up on YouTube, and. I think we are at, I'm at 30k views on that, the part one video. So I mm-hmm. really did not expect that. So I, I guess it's really going good and people are, people seem to like it. Yeah, we, we also have our tutorial channel, the tutorials channel where we publish this, this podcast as well, but also the uh, tutorials we, we are making. Uh, yeah, I did check from, out. Yeah, from, 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 out from my experience, I can say that it's really hard to predict uh, what, what video will blow up like that and... Uh, Sometimes it's a, it's just a surprise, but yeah, yeah, exactly. You, you could say that that these these ones stick stick really well, and and that's not exactly a, an accident because I've I've seen like the tutorials are really good like there. The thumbnails are Thank really you so much. tempting to click, and and the information there is laid out pretty like easily to follow. So good work on that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So what, what I'd like. To- what, what what the blue inversion means? What what that name comes from? Yeah, because because I also wanted yeah, to ask that question because I, really... I googled that I googled blue inversion and to what came up was just like some kind of uh, equipment for workout or something like that, just like inversion <laughs> tables, just in a blue color or something like that. But I I think that's not the the origin. So of the, the name, thing right? is, um, yeah, so. Last year, around November, I guess October, that would be more uh, precise. I decided to drop out of my college program. And like here, you cannot actually drop out and continue later. So I basically quit college because I was not really enjoying uh, a a college environment, a, a academic in- environment. I wanted to like go all into this because I already had this online uh, community going on, sharing tutorials and all. Uh, since like 2013 and 13, 14 ish. And I was under this name, uh, Boundless Blending for obvious reasons. I was using Blender and I was a kid who had, who didn't know any better. So I came up with this really weird name, Boundless Blending. Uh, so I, I used to post tutorials on that. Um, I think the sneaker tutorial, which I posted on the Blue Inversion channel, um, that tutorial was while I was under the name Boundless Blending, so you can still see that. So, anyways, um, by that 
by the time I reached October, I was in the first semester of my college. Um, I was studying computer science, um, Bachelor of Science program. And I decided to drop out because I wasn't able to put my time and energy uh, to make quality stuff. Um, be it tutorial or artworks, I, I, I was not really getting any focus or time to be put into this work that I really loved ever since I started. So I decided to drop out and then I decided that if I'm going to make this something serious, then I need to have a recognizable name, a unique name. And also actually I had a trademark done for that name. So I wanted to have something very unique. Otherwise, it wouldn't actually pass as a trademark legally. So First of all, I was making that sneaker tutorial while I was thinking about all of these things. And um, I I was like making a like 10 second edit in that tutorial while uh, it, it's about a shortcut that you have to use. That is that accent or tilde button on your keyboard that brings up the pie menu for changing the view in Blender. I guess uh, DJ would know that, mm -hmm. what I'm talking about. Yeah, so that was like a... It, that was introduced in Blue, uh, Blender 2.8, I guess. So a lot of people didn't really know that. So I thought about emphasizing on that shortcut. So I was like kind of showing in a entire black screen and uh, like I writ, wrote, wrote out and emphasized that this is the shortcut. You guys remember this? Yeah, it's, a, it's the accent key. Now, I, I was already searching for a name for my brand. So the accent, that word really sounded nice to me. So I thought about why not call it Accent Software or something like that, my brand. Then I looked online and there were a lot of software and already a lot of companies by that name Accent Software or mm. Accent Studios. So mm. uh, I was really I was really sad because I thought I found a really unique name, <laughs> but yeah. it wasn't really <laughs> true. <laughs> this so happens accent, often. Yeah. Like you yeah. come up with, I I had like ideas for some brands, actions, pages of Facebook and every time it was, every time it was like, okay, there is some niche computer game like, named like that already. So it's frustrating yeah. when you think that this is the one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and when you come up with it, it really sounds like, like no one can come up with that. It's so unique, so obscure. But yeah. somebody has already come up with it, surprisingly. So anyways, um, so accent didn't work. So I thought about why not call it blue accent? You know, like blue was like the color I gravitate towards all the time. Like you can call that my favorite color. So mm -hmm. I just added blue with that, blue accent. So then I thought that would be nice. Then actually I went with the word, uh, with the phrase blue accent and I met my lawyer for a trademark being done on that, but he said that it's not really, uh, it's not really unique. Just just adding blue would not make it very proper and unique for considering it for a trademark. So mm. I had to come up with something even better. So the whole accent thing had to be thrown down the window. I couldn't use accent anymore. So I kept the blue because I thought uh, blue, like keeping a color, would be something recognizable and then let's keep something that is that doesn't make any sense or it's not related to software so that make i'm like trying to find the most obscure word to add onto mm. blue so i was looking for different words and then that same accent um that accent uh symbol that's that uh squiggly line on top so that symbol i searched for synonyms for that now i'm uh, DJ would know that I, I made some shader packs. So um, I'm really deep into this math and vector kind of stuff. So I keep reading math stuff all the time. So the formulas have this uh, tilde sometimes, uh, the accent, that symbol. It is for inversion. Like you can invert a uh, condition using that. That's a mathematical symbol as well. So I thought about going with inversion. So the original idea of using the tilde as a symbol is kept mm -hmm then I just, instead of calling it accent, I called it inversion, which is the mathematical equivalent of that. So blue inversion, it came up. And actually uh, the, sim the logo of my brand was supposed to have that accent, the tilde, but again, my lawyer said that you cannot keep that accent, uh, that symbol as a, in part of your logo because it's not unique enough. It's a symbol hmm. 
already established so you have to come up with something else so that also that accent completely went out of the map and i was left with blue inversion so that's the story yeah uh, like it, it kind of like sounds pretty like cg i ish because uh, it it sounds like inverting i don't know the blue channel for example like a secret yeah. trick for yeah. something in, in cgi yeah. generally so i think it's good because it's it's kind of like a little bit mystical you know you don't really know what it's about but it's yeah. science sounds kind of like yeah, like CGI. Yeah, it turns out it was yeah sharpening it techniques sounds or like that. Something like that. I think there is something called the inversion or infusion soft, maybe that might come close to the sound of it. Infusion soft, I think there is something like that. But yeah, I haven't found anything with inversion or blue inversion, something like that yet. Yeah, you mentioned uh, you mentioned your shader packs that you're offering on your web yep. web page. So they, they are pr- uh, procedural materials and. Uh, I wanted yeah. to ask you, like, how how did you get into that uh, area of of blenders in particular? Uh, and uh, the next question that maybe to be answered alongside is, uh, who is your procedural shaders guru? Yeah, so uh, sure. Now, actually, Blender actually blew up in the past couple years, I would say, or maybe even the past year. I can say specifically, it like completely blew up blew up among artists of all kinds. Mm-hmm. So right now, uh, you can say that Simon Thoms, if you have heard about him. Yeah, we, ha- we have. Thoms. Indeed, we, we even had a live stream with, uh, with him. Had the pleasure before awesome. he was, before, before really? he was uh, in, yeah, in, introducing to the Blender Foundation. So just before that, great, we had the chance great. Of, of interviewing him. On That's our crazy, channel. actually. I didn't really see that video. I, do you have it online? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it should be up on the channel. We'll That's generally we'll leave awesome, a li- awesome. link in the video description of this uh, podcast uh, for sure, like for people mm-hmm. to to be able to yeah. watch that. It was very like, yeah, he's he's very yeah. good at explaining things as well. That's really great. I've seen his. Uh, I saw. I found him on during the November whole thing, the kind the time he blew up actually. So yeah. Um, now the thing is that um, I have been into procedural and the shader things like way back. Uh, five years ago when I like kind of started I had other shader packs as well which were shaders were not that good but they were still procedural and I like I had always been this shader guy and uh, Simon Thoms really uh, opened up opened it up for me he uh, introduced the whole uh, after the vector displacement was there he uh, really connected the dots for me like how you can use the actual vector math and convert it into uh, this displacement because um, okay so let me like I'm all over the place right now let me like start with my uh, initial story so back in 2015 ish I decided to make a product because um, you know like I wanted to see how the community reacts to it because they liked my free shaders so I was already like um, good at modeling and rendering lighting like pretty average you can say like i was comfortable with this part of the computer graphics uh, art related this field but shaders were also always a um, you can say it was always a shortcoming back in the days in my in my workflow and back in the days there were not so many blender artists uh, popping up on the social media channels we had a few like of course we had um, andrew price and we had gleb recently started on his youtube journey and also uh, there was renante martinez i don't know if you have heard about him yeah yeah it's, he had also a shader pack like cycles materials yeah. or something like that yeah exactly exactly and before that he was he used to uh, like just post his renders of these of his shaders uh, i think most of his shaders were image based like image textures, not procedural all the time, but uh, the way he used the image textures and made the final shaders, they looked really well, like really well made. And back in the days, Blender didn't have such a robust shading system. So Cycles just came ar- came around and uh, we can use this path tracer for the first time and make realistic shaders. So he really inspired me to get into shaders. So the thing is, I was so so less confident about my shaders that I decided to go all in into this subject of shaders and let's see how far I can get because there were not so much so so many documentations or there were not 
tutor- tutorials where I don't think there are such good tutorials even till now. Um, so resources were very uh, less. So all I had was trial and error. So I just opened up Blender documentation that the official Blender Foundation provides with Blender. And I read everything. Like I read from the first word to the last word. Everything under shader editor. Every node and what they do. And also the math related to that. Like all the math nodes and how you can transform, rotate vectors and stuff. Like I read the whole, everything related to shaders in that in that period of one or two years. Uh, I was back in school. Uh, I didn't have too much of a like deadline or something. I just wanted to make sure that I'm not afraid of shaders anymore. So I really doubled down on it. And by the time I started releasing free shaders and Blender, Blender Nation, if you have heard about it, they picked up my shaders. I used to post them on um, my YouTube channel under Boundless Blending, of course, back in the, back in those days. And uh, people really started liking my shaders. And Gumroad also came around. So it was really easy for me to share the files in an easy way. So I put them on Gumroad and people would really love it. Like I would get th- thousands of downloads in a week. And uh, there were also a lot of shortage of procedural shaders back then. So it also helped me market myself this way. So slowly and slowly, before I knew, uh, shaders became a core strength of my workflow. And people wanted a whole pack of like, like you know, if I can give them some, a lot of shaders under one category, maybe metals or uh, maybe wood or nature or something like that. So that, you know, uh, they can uh, get those shaders and like make a library of shaders so that you can, they can use in the workflow in the production environment easily uh, so i thought about it's it might be a great opportunity to make a product because i've already seen enterprises products work very well and since i really i i <laughs> i have to say this i hated school and i hated anything related to academia like the, i think the the best way to ruin a subject for a child is to put that in his syllabus so <laughs> Uh, so that really happened with me i was not really enjoying anything i was not particularly a bad student but um i was i was i was pretty above average i would say according to my marks and grades but i re- i really lost interest after 7th grade and i was i was really having a bad time at school i was not enjoying anything i was learning but i was not enjoying anything so mm-hmm. i thought why not try this um outlet maybe i can reach the customers directly and at the end of the day any job any anything comes down to the business of the company so we are all dependent on business so it's not really that risky as a lot of people say so i like i was a child i was not that smart as i'm talking right now but i really took a leap of faith and wanted to try how things work mm-hmm. and if i can make some money uh, off of my off of the things that i love so i started um posting products on shaders and then people liked it some people gave me constructive criticism uh, I, i'm really like um, like really i would like to thank them the people who bought them initially because my products were not very polished back then i had lots of bugs and uh, i was not very sure about the pricing model and like since they were not there were literally no sh- shader packs to compare my uh, prices to so i had no idea whether i'm underselling myself or overselling myself um, then Renato Martinez came out with uh, Cycles Materials Vault. So that really inspired me further to push my work. Um, so that's how it started. And then as I got more and more requests from customers to make this kind of shaders or to change, add some new feature to these shaders, then I started learning more math or I started learning more uh, shading, lighting principles. And that's how I kept working on my craft. But then uh, in the middle, it's like uh, in my 10th, 11th and 12th grade, like I don't know how it works in your country, but in our country, it's like after 10th grade, uh, there's this 11 and 12. So these two grades, you are like kind of preparing for college. So mm-hmm. you like specialize on something like you you uh, pick some subjects. Like if you want to be a doctor, you pick up biology. If you want to be an engineer or some, some tech tech the technology guy that you pick up computer science and math and this kind of things you had to make choices so for sure i i pick up, i picked computer science and maths uh because 
if i ever do a job i will do i'll be something in the tech world not in the medicine world so that's for that that was for sure and obviously i'm an asian kid and here if you are not choosing either one of those there are no other uh, professions that your parents will support you for mm. so basically i had to pick engineering and of course computer science was my target um and i i was studying back then and back in the days uh, it's it was it was a very scary time i would say not not that much but in a academic way in a job way that it's like time now you're growing up uh, now you now it's time for you to uh, be serious about your life you cannot just have fun anymore so that was the time um, which when i really couldn't do anything in blender and i kind of told my subscribers and my followers that uh, i'm taking a break or something i don't know when i'll be back and thank you for all your support and that was really something stupid i did i should have kept on doing it if i even if the little time i got but anyways i wanted to focus on this side of my life on my academics so that i can get some like like i can get somewhere because even as much passionate i am i was not really sure of having a business online on my own and making it a success i i didn't really believe in that back then so much and my parents were not very sure of business of obviously because here nobody has ever done it and mm. they didn't even understand anything i told them or even my friends it's not mm. like uh anybody ever did it they had no examples to point to so it was really a very risky thing to leave academics completely so i had to focus on academics and i had no time for this side of the things and i slowly lost touch with shaders and the whole thing as a as like as its entirety sometimes i would watch a few youtube tutorials or some youtube some blender conference things because i'm still passionate about it so i kept on uh, noticing all the sh- changes in the shaders that shader system that blender introduced the vector displacement was a really big one i i had no time to like understand it so i didn't really understand what happened and then uh i really like i i will say i, I felt completely uh less confident about the whole thing now the whole the whole blender changed for me because uh the 2.8 update came around the time in i was in 12th grade and i had not done blender for one year nothing i, I didn't have that software on my comp- i like on my pc even the latest mm-hmm. one so 2.8 actually changed everything the whole interface and everything just changed so that was a big blow to me i felt like okay even if i want to co- make a comeback it would be a long time before i even understand my own skills again into this uh, new system and into this new interface so it was it was like a more more intensive incentive to uh, keep on going with my studies and not come back now i got into a college uh, after 12th it was in 2019 last year and it was a computer science program uh in college it it's uh, it's the scottish church college in kolkata it was called calcutta if you guys don't know about it the name changed to kolkata anyways uh it's in my mm-hmm. um it's in the west bengal state where i'm from in india and i got enrolled enrolled there and i started started studying and i had high hopes actually like i i was i, I as i said i'm interested in maths and computer science tech things so i thought i'd learn a lot and then maybe come back to blender and things like that one day after i graduate but um uh, it turns out that the syllabus that we have in our college and i'm not really talking about my particular college or any specific state or city i'm just saying colleges in general the syllabus they have is uh, they try to teach you bottom up so it's like mm-hmm. if you want to if you want to learn piano like if you want to learn how to make a song they teach you notes first they teach you mm-hmm. the instrument the piano how it was invented how many keys does it have so you by the time you reach that point of making a song you have already lost all enthusiasm and mm-hmm. it's like they make you ex- uh, do exercises which are lengthy and which are very boring like do uh, practice your skills on piano for 5 hours every day uh, for one year before you are allowed to write a song so mm-hmm. basically that's how everything is taught in colleges not just computer science so they also started teaching computer science in that way 
nothing i have no nothing against my teachers there they were really friendly they just followed what they were told by the university we had the syllabus so they started teaching python and they started teaching c++ the programming languages and python that i already taught myself when i was working with blender back in the days because i wanted to make add-ons so i thought that the college would really teach me something new but the python they taught was the same so i already done that and then they touched it started teaching c++ and i really decided to sit down and try to learn c++ then i saw i'm making much more progress on my own and i did not like the example projects and exercise projects they gave me i would instead make build blender from source or something to learn c++ better so i had these ideas and i felt like i knew how to learn in a in my way and i thought that if i try to follow somebody else's way of learning then i would lose touch with my talents or things that i am mm-hmm. good at so i thought mm-hmm. um so i finally like i'm already in college my parents were not very much worried as much because now i have decided on something i will get a job after i graduate so they were not so much worried but um uh, they were happy but um i was not really enjoying the program and i knew if i did not come back to blender after the whole graduation ended i would still regret the whole college thing and i would not be enjoying at a job either which mm-hmm. is not involving blender so i decided since i'm still passionate about blender and i want to do these things then why not just take a leap of faith and just let, let me see how it works if i go full time with my blender business and by that time blender has all, already blown up so i saw a little ray of hope that maybe like if the industry is accepting blender then blender will be a bigger market by the time i come back and so i started working in blender again and i learned the 2.8 interface and everything in a month and i also by the time uh, it was like october novemberish and that no- november was coming up i saw simon Th- simon thoms make such incredible things with blender which i never thought would be possible in blender because there was no support for it back in the days but now it was there and i saw this whole pl- possibility that i already had some knowledge in shading and procedural shaders i knew some math i knew some programming so why not just get into it and learn in a top to bottom manner instead of uh, like you know the project based mm-hmm. learning yeah. method yeah. you you keep making something and you keep studying fractions of the knowledge and keep filling them until you know the whole thing so that's what i started doing i started learning as i started making tutorials like i was not learning and sharing in a separate way i was learning as i was sharing and i was creating products and shaders as i was learning about the products and shaders and about marketing and everything so i thought about let's make my own curriculum and let's follow that and if i fail i will fail uh by myself i would not fail because somebody else told me something to do so mm-hmm. i would fail because i decided to do this not because like if i fail in my way then i will not regret as much as uh if i fail somebody else by following somebody else's commands or yeah and there's there's also the risk that you succeed right <laughs> so <laughs> yeah true <laughs> so, so yeah i was thinking about what we are talking about the education and how you didn't like the you know like this uh, uh grinding with with basics and learning them for the sake of learning them and then maybe using them So did it affect the way you are doing your tutorials? Um yeah, so uh that has been a big part of the shift in my uh tutorial making process. I used to make tutorials back in the days and they were more like a rip off of the other YouTubers what they did <laughs> like uh Gleb and Andrew Price. They the, the kind of sh- tutorials they made, I just tried to copy it because I was a kid back then. I didn't know any better. But now I decided to make something make a video that is really valuable to the viewer if they can really learn the way i personally learn then that would be really huge for me that would be the biggest proof of my learning thesis uh, that mm-hmm. it works so i started making a uh, long form content like for example the sneaker video i made i don't know if you have mm-hmm. checked that out um i also made this car tutorial now 
so i started making something huge that would feel like uh, a intermediate or beginner blender artist would feel like it's slightly out of reach but if they can accomplish it it would give them a lot of reward re- rewarding feeling that they accomplished mm-hmm. something like they like they stepped up their game by one one level so i wanted to give that feeling to my audience so mm-hmm. um so there was there was this huge rush of uh one minute tutorials by ian hubert if you have seen those yeah the one yeah, I've one seen minute I, i really enjoyed the, <laughs> this, yeah. this was but this is really i, I think you, you mentioned ripping off other artists like i'm yeah, yeah, yeah. trying to rip off this idea is like <laughs> You can't, you know, it can't be the the other Jim Carrey or whatever. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so right, personal. Right. It's so yeah. I I mean, uh, so I said that because um, I was really a bit insecure that if people re- really gravitating towards such short form tutorials, then uh, my uh, skill at teaching wouldn't really work because I I tend to make long form beginner or intermediate level tutorials. Uh, and they have to be told everything step by step so that's my cadence i i i didn't i like i cannot imagine myself making what ian hubert does and he does it really well um and i don't really want to make that so i had this insecurity that people would not find my content uh, interesting enough because they were long but mm-hmm. then i did my best and i thought let's let's just give it a shot and let's make very big projects like maybe an entire sneaker from scratch all the modeling all the shading uh, if there is any sculpting that and then animating animating that also so also this car uh, from scratch so these things are like sold as courses and there is a lack of good qu- qu- uh, quality stuff on youtube um so i i thought why not make a complete thing that people can watch and have a final product instead of giving them a uh, fast tutorials because i was really tempted to make um uh, fast tutorials in one one minute form because that was the hot thing back in the days uh, at that time uh so yeah so i thought let's just go completely opposite and make extremely long form tutorials with many parts and explain them as much uh with as much depth as i can and make and make a really dense tutorial with lots of knowledge in it so that uh the intermediate or beginner blender artist can really step up their entire knowledge base and go one level up so I, that's the kind of formula i'm trying to follow right now and it seems like people are slowly trying to uh, slowly they're uh, enjoying my work and they're also finding my work so that's a really great thing for me because uh, i was really insecure about the long form content whether it will work or not yeah i've i've seen like i've seen the i think blenderness podcast uh, discussing this topic uh, especially like the youtubers uh, involved in it uh, Curtis Holt and uh, other ones i don't know if you've ever seen this uh, form uh, the blender nest the blender nest yeah i heard blender about nest. it i, I didn't yeah, have they, the they, opportunity they discussed to learn. The, they discussed Listen. the long uh, the long versus short uh, term the short content like even like one of the guys talking there cg matter he he has even like two separate channels for each type of content like he makes oh, yeah. short CG shorter battery, ones yeah. like a, like more more Ian Hubertish styled you know these funny little uh chunks of of information yeah. and then he goes uh, like with the long uh, explainer videos as well yeah, he I've has separate those, channels yeah. for channels for for both of these types of content but so and what what I think it was Kurt, Curtis Holt said that there's really like the audience for both of these content concepts like and sometimes That's it's even the same true, audience yeah. so sometimes you just want to watch a short funny you know <laughs> just a teaser videos kind of thing and then if you're really want wanting some more in-depth look on something particular you just want this longer expa- explainer like you said like course type video and there's yeah. still the demand for it I agree. and I, i think that it's for for youtube algorithm is also you know shorter shorter ones are, are maybe watched many more times but then they don't give you that much watch time if you have like a good really good long term long video yeah, yeah. then people, YouTube algorithm yeah yeah then True. people just watch it longer right yeah i i have an average um watch time for this car tutorial 
uh, each part has like four or five minutes of average watch time so that's really good in a way yeah mm-hmm. that's a nice point uh, for making long form content and also i also think i've, I've realized this that um, ever since blender blew up there's like such a um, range of audience for it that you can never really satisfy them with one type of content so there as you said uh, there will be people who want ian huber type of uh, type of videos and there will also be people who are like just coming up who want to have a full course experience mm-hmm. so and even the same person might have such demands at different times in their career so i think yeah i that's a really nice uh, thought that there's audience for both of them and it doesn't have to be a, a one or the other or a zero sum game in this kind of a industry so so are you rather going to this technical part of 3d like uh, creating shaders programming or you would prefer to just create your images so uh, that's a very interesting question i always keep, find myself thinking about uh, the direction i'm trying to go and right now i'm popular because of the tutorials whatever uh, mm-hmm. subscribers have got because of the tutorials so i i guess i'll be making tutorials for for some time at least in the future because that is uh, giving a lot of attention to my work and basically i'm selling shaders so i also have to keep up my technical side so mm-hmm. i i see it as i do not want to sell knowledge i don't want to sell uh, tutorials or courses i want to keep them as free and keep that as a marketing outlet uh, inlet into my world and then mm-hmm. um, sell my software the shaders or the plugins or any, any anything else any software solution i come up with so sell them the product in that way and keep the knowledge as a free content on my youtube or blog wherever i think this model i would stick to for some time now and the artwork uh, yes i have always been a blender artist of course and it was the first inspiration because at the end of the day we are all trying to make images or animations with cg all these shaders and any plugin that i make it doesn't have any value on its own but if it helps somebody to make a better image in a more efficient way or it helps the studios make movies in a more efficient in a better way that's when the value comes of that product so at the end of the day we are all artists at some level in this industry so i would say that yes and i have some visions uh, related to the art side of things like uh, for example right now there's this bloom of crypto art going on if you guys have heard about this space crypto art i need to check on it quick quickly crypto art it's like uh, it's a non fungible token system it's also called nfts so it's like they have made this platform on ethereum it is a kind of cryptocurrency um mm-hmm. technology so on this technology they have made a decentralized marketplace uh, actually there are multiple of those and i'll come to that um on this on this marketplaces you can actually auction off your digital work Mm -hmm. and it you can do that in a way that you can have scarcity in a digital space which means you can sign you can digitally sign your artwork and there will only be one digitally signed piece that somebody mm-hmm. can own if it might be you or if you auction it off to somebody that collector can have that yeah that, the originality thing is solved yeah. when it comes to digital so and wow. that sign sign cannot be uh, duplicated because the way the blockchain works is that there's only one uh, record of that signed digital art that's like a that's like an ethereum uh, program that is that cannot uh-huh. be duplicated it can only be transferred mm-hmm. so that makes it rare so it's this concept of digital scarcity has been invented mm-hmm. i would say in a, in the last in the last year and it has started to gain its popularity um over the past few weeks i would say and i have applied at a lot of places i am already on one of the platforms it's called rareable and i'm a verified artist there and uh it it's it has already kind of blown up the rareable marketplace has uh, kind of blown up there are other platforms like super rare there's also known origin and also makers place 
these websites are more of a like you have to apply and once you are completely verified that's the time they allow you to auction your work so this is a very exciting thing that uh, i want to explore more in the future uh, currently this whole crypto currency thing is allowed and legal in my country but uh, they are not very happy with the scene the whole uh, the state losing control over the money they don't like mm-hmm. that unlike the western countries so i don't know if india will keep it legal but if they do i want to explore this space more and i want to put my artworks or even animations or even in the future some music videos on there so i have a long term idea for that but mm-hmm. otherwise i love making artworks in general even if that doesn't make me any money i would rather make to tu- rather make tutorials for those artworks and try to convert that into something monetizable but i will continue to make artworks and animations and i have a whole vision of making a uh, making a character and having a world of itself and have some music surrounding that as well so i have this vision and i think it will take some time but i'm on my way Wow, mm-hmm. this is fascinating what you said about this crypto art like this is some kind of new new market that emerged and uh i was just thinking that you said that it may be ele- delegalized in india so but yeah. this so this this crypto art is only uh, a technology right like yep, the dig- exactly. digital signature it's not doesn't have to be connected to connected with bitcoin or exactly. stuff like that right that's a wow. very nice question Uh, actually the the platforms that i am on right now that is variable uh there it's not possible you actually have to make all transactions on ethereum so you cannot have it on uh-huh. any us us dollars or anything else it has to be in ethereum not even any other cryptocurrency but ethereum and on the other places as well but i only know one platform if i'm not wrong it is no uh, it is makers place or maybe known origin that also allow you to bid the money in us currency but mm-hmm. there's a catch even if they allow it it's not going to work because all this money that these collectors have is because of the cryptocurrency boom in back in back in 10 years they have this mm-hmm. cryptocurrency because they have the money because they invested in cryptocurrency early so this these are the people who are the collectors on this platform mm-hmm. so if you do not allow them to pay in cryptocurrency then exchanging that huge sum of money into us currency and then paying them will make it a one step harder for the whole industry to bloom so i don't think that would yeah. be a nice solution another Oops. solution that i have thought of is that uh, some people already do this when where there is uh, it is illegal to trade in cryptocurrency what they do is they have a counterpart in the country where they're selling or where the website is working and they have an account and they do all the uh, transactions in bitcoin and then they manually send them uh, in us currency or like state regulated currency in exchange and take some percentage off just like working as a partner you can say mm-hmm. so that's another way of working if it's illegal wow you know i actually I did that that was the question like similar question i wanted to ask you and it's a very good uh, like uh, anchor point to ask it because i was thinking that you are very young generations from a very young generation of cg artists and now in general the the conception of uh, of cg is that uh with experience with years of of you know working you you get better you get some competitive uh uh, uh advantage over over uh, less experienced cg artists but is there anything that you can see that as a person from this generation you already have an advantage over people who started with cg let's say 20 years ago is is this, there something you can feel or or see that you already like you are already step ahead and and the, the older generation is is kind of uh uh be behind you okay uh this is a very uh very nice question i i will say because this actually doesn't have to limit itself to cg world this is a general question for any field where you have to get a lot of knowledge to start making good money or start making being uh something someone qualified for for work i would like to mm-hmm. say i have also given this 
idea a long long thought for many years and i have come to this conclusion that both matter experience matter and also being young matters now first of all uh, being young would mean that you do not know what is right so you mm-hmm. are more uh, open to possibilities so you are not afraid of something of doing something because first of all you don't know whether it is right or wrong so you have to try many things and secondly you are not afraid of the of the repercussions because you do not have too many responsibilities on you so let's say we are so the risk factor is always going to stop a adult or a old mm-hmm. per, uh, like a generally uh, older generation to start taking huge risks but i have this idea that um after this whole ai machine learning uh, experiments and this uh, this whole whole industry coming becoming such consumable le- level uh, thing i did a lot of research on that i mean uh, studies on that not research uh, what i came to the conclusion is that um generally we would consider that google and facebook and all these big companies who have a lot of data aka experience they can make the total use of ai and this technology and there's nobody who can beat them which mm-hmm. is the a uh, general idea that's the concept that's what made everybody fear uh, ai being in the wrong hands now the, the now the catch here is that there has already been a lot of competitions in ai um many companies sponsoring competitions and stuff and their google engineers are also there and there are also independent uh, engineers younger uh, not that qualified engineers working and there has been many occasions where this uh, where the giants have been beaten now this is because they are open to possibilities now if you see at a ai machine learning um, algorithm let's say you you must have seen some video on this there are so many viral videos uh, teaching a um, ai to play some game maybe mm-hmm. tic tac toe or something or maybe alpha go you might might have watched that one yeah um, yeah so it's a great one yeah that's a nice documentary i have also watched that and so the thing is if you have a machine learning model which has to take a thousand iterations before it can get as good as a human being um uh, as opposed to another machine learning uh, algorithm that does it at 10 iterations then of course that one is better so it's all about how fast you are gaining how fast you are able to identify what doesn't work so you have to fail very fast you have to fail many times in your life mm-hmm. so if somebody experienced has failed much more times than uh, somebody starting out so that is where the experience gives him a plus and the younger person has has a lot of room for risks so he can get uh, get ahead in that section so if you are experienced if you are young for young people if you want to be as good as experienced people then you have to change your algorithm of learning you have to oh. set it up in such a way that you have to you can fail really fast you, have, you you fail with very little risk and you learn very fast set up your environment in such a way you have you can fail without big risks and then oh. you can earn experience very fast and for experienced people who have let's say they do not did not have a very efficient algorithm for learning all through these years they can also do the same thing to get ahead of mm-hmm. these younger people because they do not have this much knowledge about how to learn fast they are starting to learn they have haven't learned they haven't even learned uh, anything on their own they have been taught everything at school they don't know how to there are many ways to learn so use that knowledge you can learn faster so i don't think there's much of a difference between an experienced uh, learner or a younger learner or executioner the difference is that you have to take advantage of your strengths so if you are experienced use all the experience to 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 skyrocket your progress and if you are young then use your time and risk and your uh, efficiency to your full advantage so i would say you can balance them both out and it's not like there's any limit to age in the cg industry you can start any time and you can be really really good at it and if you are really young and want to be in the cg industry then 
in, in any industry, I would say, I, I think you can dive in. And if you do not like it, after five years, you can change path. And the society is, is such right now that you can change careers anytime. And if you are willing to work hard, you can make a living in any field you want right now with the internet. Th that's interesting that you you actually described like you need to learn how to learn and this is a this is a topic that pops up, pops up everywhere like like the, of, of our times people people need to learn how to learn in, in this in these times where everything is changing so fast you really need to like uh, for example Andrew Price also was doing uh some some videos about it like habits of of, of effect, efficient yeah, artists I, I, i saw that he came back with his podcast it was really nice because uh i used to listen to his podcast and it was a big inspiration uh, like he had the blender guru podcast years ago and i listened to every mm -hmm. episode when it came out and then he kind of stopped uh c like kind of at the time when i stopped so it was really nice watching the whole podcast coming back Yeah, and I saw that episode on learning. Yeah, I was. Yeah, by the, by the way, by the way, you also did a few episodes on the podcast last uh, year. Last yeah, this year, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and and it was like eight episode was yep. the last one, and probably yep. you were interrupted for preparing the the shader pass, right? Or something yeah, like that. I took a sabbatical, well, I and also I couldn't come back into the podcast because was there was this uh, minor technical problem from my distributor. Um, I use Anchor to distribute my. Uh, podcast everywhere and for some reason they did not distribute it to any platforms except spotify so i had to manually reach out to them through email and they responded and this whole process took a long time so i did not want to post another um, episode before it was available everywhere because people hit me up saying it's not available anywhere except spotify mm -hmm. and so i decided to come back after this is resolved It is currently under mm -hmm. works. I think it is available on Google Podcasts now, but I will make a uh, comeback on that. Yeah, that's, that's what I wanted to ask. If you're planning on getting back to the podcasting thing, I think yeah, that I, your I podcast think, started uh, out really nice. And thank you, thank you. Uh, I think um, podcasting is a side uh, passion, I would say, from from my side because I have listened to many old podcasts and I really love them. Like. It's a whole vibe once you start listening to a podcast, and since you can, it's a passive form of consumption. You can do something and still have it run for hours, and you still gain knowledge and insights from the guests. Yeah. So it has really it had a lot of effect on me uh, back in the days. Most of my inspiration and motivation came from this Blender podcasts that Blender Guru did, and he also had guests on. So it really opened up a lot of possibilities for me, and I do think those times were very were some of the most exciting times in my life and made me really think about what I was trying to do. And so podcasting has a very interesting place in my heart and I don't really see it as a very profitable content source right now because as you can see, the podcast did not get too many hits like my YouTube channel, uh, other videos does, mm -hmm. like uh, a yeah, tutorial. Like it doesn't go viral that often and it doesn't like people do not everybody does not listen to long form content if it is not directly giving them a instant gratification or instant value out of it so podcasting is not very short term oriented i i think like i can make some a deeper connection with my audience with the podcast and maybe in the long term i will have some returns on it but i i generally do it because um i really love being on the mic and uh try to be free and um like let go of some of my thoughts and ideas and i also get take some feedback from my core audience because those are the people who listen so yeah that's that's always going to be there on my channel whether they, it does good or not so that's something i'd like to like to add yeah cool i i sign in for that but you know i, I was thinking about thank you the the the, the smart sh shaders and yep. just the we started to talk about artificial intelligence and learning and yeah. I'm a big fan of art breeder. And I was thinking, do you think this is possible to connect procedural shading with something like art breeder, where you could basically half randomly, half helped by the 
former decisions of the of the of the uh, this uh, software like uh, peak or fish for cool variations of materials something like that do you think that's it's a thing could be a thing um on this question i would say that um if you are talking about procedural shaders in blender i would say it's a little bit different if you're talking mm -hmm. about um substance designer then that's different because substance designer is works doesn't work with vectors but it mm -hmm. works with bitmap so it's much easier to work with substance paint designer like for example if you want to mirror a pattern you mm -hmm. just have to give it a mirror node i haven't used substance designer that much but i believe that's how you do it there's one function to do it but in blender there's there's no functionality you just have the math node and the vector node you have to form mm -hmm. a vector uh function for mirroring so it's a lot of work mm -hmm. and also blender does not support millions of nodes it starts crashing at one point so you cannot get that much complex with the nodes either you have to be very efficient so i think make to for ai to learn how to make procedural shaders in blender it's going to be much tough compared to substance painter or substance designer but mm -hmm. um can it learn ever to make procedural shaders like a human being or give us variations i think absolutely yes if a human being can learn it i think the ai can learn it too yeah mm -hmm. i think if you if you mention art breeder in particular it's kind of like mixing images together so it's it's a little, a little bit like bitmap bitmap mixing thing yeah. so probably some kind of like a hybrid approach could be could be like, possible right now I think. yeah like but the guided, biggest difficulty that I, mm -hmm. yeah uh, i was saying that uh, the biggest difficulty in this uh procedural field would be that uh we need a lot of control over the process of making the shader because let's say um the kind the kind of ai that we have mm. until now is it can do something very very specific it's really good it's much better than, than a human at doing that one thing we cannot beat it but it is mm -hmm. not good at anything else you give it something else it is stupid it's the most stupid human being on this planet it doesn't understand it so mm -hmm. for making procedural shaders the way it is made we are making it procedural for a reason we are making it procedural because we want some control over the inputs we want to have some level of abstraction let's say we are making a uh, wood shader then we want to have control over the number of rings in that wood texture the kind of specularity it has the kind of color it has so we know what the inputs will be and trying to train a ai model that can listen to what kind of thing we want to keep as a parameter after that procedural shader has been made will be very difficult because mm -hmm. because it's not like you have you can feed them a wood texture image and they will give you uh how will you tell it that what is a ring on a wood texture and i want that parameter to be affected and you have to make the vectors in that way or i want to make change the it's a very particular thing in it and give me a parameter for that and make connect all the nodes in such a way that i get input value for that so these are the challenges i'm not saying this is not possible but it's i think far in the future mm -hmm. well yeah i you know i when i started like um on in, after college right after college i went back to 3ds max because as a kid i was playing around with just 3ds studio and i remember that um i i really didn't like the i didn't like didn't like to go so much into painting textures and i hate uh, unwrapping and stuff like that and i hoped for like okay so i will now learn some procedural textures in in 3ds max and there was not many of them then in v-ray also there was was not many of them some of them were basically like kind of naive like I'm, i mean with smart usage you can create a lot but some of them looked like i don't know they were created to show that there is something like procedural texture and now and all, i was was i also looked for any procedural textures for for 3ds max for some time and i was uh, not very successful with that so yeah so do you think that 
if you would like to go into more procedural workflow, moving to Blender would be a good idea. I think um, if you want if you want to make procedural shaders for mm-hmm. um, being a procedural artist and want to work in the industry, like in movies and games, then I would say, and you do not like math or you already do not have a v- huge background in math, I would say stick with uh, Substance Designer because it is mm-hmm. way better than Blender at making procedural shaders and you can concept a shader very fast. The time mm-hmm. it takes to plan a shader is much less in Substance Designer because it's a much more forgiving environment. It's not vector-based, so you can do many more manipulations and stuff without breaking your system. So mm-hmm. so it's I would say it's a much better uh, career choice if you if you ask me that you should if you want to be a procedural shader artist just stick with uh, substance designer it's not even that expensive but uh, mm-hmm. if you want to be in so that the the only reason i am using blender right now is that it is vector based which is the actual weakness that i just talked about but it is since it is vector based you have this possibility of having infinite resolution mm-hmm. so it's not bitmap based like in uh, it will not start pixeling out once you zoom yeah. So you can have infinite um, possibilities like that. Not only resolution, but you can also have many different things which you can do once you understand it, which you cannot do with uh, bitmaps. It gives you a lot more, uh, like I said, resolution. And if if you do not have any, any restriction on the resolution, and if you want, if you can get to the level of Substance Designer using the vectors in Blender, then you can beat Substance Designer. I say, like that's the best procedural material you have made if you can keep the quality of substance designer plus you get this infinite resolution then it obviously beats substance designer so blender has to introduce a lot of different changes and it also have to make the node system more robust like like i said let's say for mirroring you should have presets and already pre-made uh node groups for that so that it's easier to iterate over ideas um you know, and uh, it 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 also has to improve the way it handles many nodes. Currently, like I said, it has a ceiling for the number of nodes you can have. It doesn't even uh, register. It doesn't. It crashes once you have too many nodes. So these are the weaknesses I can see in Blender. Uh, but uh, like I said, it's vector based, and it can have infinite possibilities if it can. If the Blender developers can navigate this place properly if they can bring such necessary changes that's what i would say but otherwise if yeah, you so just I'm, I'm, yeah if you just want I, to I be in this industry then use substance designer that's, that's yeah i was wondering uh, about your uh, your views on uh, the development of of this part of blender because it's like uh, the things that you mentioned they, I'm, I'm sure that the developers are aware of because it's 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 being hard to work on like the the whole node uh, everything note, notes projects uh, yeah, yeah. and I heard about stuff that, yeah. that is being developed and uh, probably they are right now working on making Blender a real power horse on that one, right? Yeah. So hopefully in the future releases that that might improve. Yeah, I I, th- I I'm really looking forward to that um, because the Blender has already made so much improvement in other fields. Right now, if you are if you want to model anything, then I would definitely recommend Blender. It's like superb at it, unless you want to do uh, CAD modeling and if you are okay with subdivision surface modeling like for concept or illustration or animation then Blender is fine it, it's the best modeler out there if you in- install the add-ons for hard surface and so many add-ons are there and if you use that with conjunction with the vanilla Blender it's like the best modeling software available there and also the lighting the real-time system EV that Blender has it is also the best I would say if you want to do concept work uh, anime kind of work that is non-photorealistic rendering and if you want to do uh, this kind of uh, concept work maybe you just need if you are a 2d concept artist they can make a huge benefit out of it like dj was saying the other day uh, about jama jurabev how he has leveraged blender's uh, real-time system and grease pencil Yeah, for the concept thing you mentioned, you mentioned EV, and uh, you're working with the shaders that work for EV, and I think they also work for cycles. So which yeah. which one do you prefer to 
work with like the, as a render engine? Um, as a render engine, for my artworks, I would say that um, Eevee does the work most of the time because basically I'm a concept artist or illustrator, you can say. So I do not need to animate them or I do not need very photorealistic effects. Uh, I do not need to, I'm not a visualizer. Uh, so I can keep them a little bit uh, fantasy type. So a little bit painterly. So it doesn't matter if it is 100% accurate. So a rasterizer like EV can solve my issues most of the time. But the shaders that I'm making, that is more like oriented towards uh, realistic, photorealistic renders and users working for like, maybe product visualization or in movies. So that part, I prefer cycles. I'm also giving them support for EV for the shaders that support them because all the nodes are not, uh, all the nodes are not supported by EV and it's a rasterizer. So some of the concepts you cannot use there because um, it's like it renders the, at the pixel level. So the window, the screen level. So you cannot make many differences like viewing like viewing through many transparent layers or what object is behind what exposing that uh, distance concept in the node editor these things are difficult if you are using a rasterizing render engine like ev so their cycles is definitely much better i would say yeah yeah, yeah i was uh, i was like thinking about because uh, you mentioned like the the non-realistic uh, approach like uh, for example, if you take artists like like the Mantisa, El Sinav, uh, Mitch Sinave, he makes like a motion graphics art more most yeah, of the yeah. time. It's it's not really for real, his work. realistic, yeah. but he's yeah, but he's re really using. He, pre he said that he prefers using cycles because of some of the effects that are available yeah, yeah. there. Even if you're doing like an abstract artwork, it just allows you for a little bit more variety, despite the longer render time. So that you handle with probably more gear. Or a service like ours, like a render farm, if you can, if you need to use it. Uh, yeah. So the other question I wanted to ask you, if you rendered with cycles, have you ever had a chance of using any, any kind of a render farm? Uh, I haven't actually, because uh, it's like, I never really uh, knew whether the whole privacy thing is properly followed or not. I haven't used any, so I heard it's really good, and some some of the render farms are giving you complete uh, transparency in that in that side of things that your files will not be shared with anyone. So I do not really use them. And right now, the kind of projects that I'm doing, I do have a powerful PC, so it's the deadlines are met properly. But I plan on making animations in the near future, so I have some. Uh, ideas in the back of my mind to work with render farms but um, i'm not really sure how they still like uh, handle the privacy thing so i, I wanted to ask you this question like uh, does your render farm what what's the privacy policy for the files that we're uploading it's um so from technical level it's like all the files are only on your private account and our administrators and developers and the data center administrators uh, take care of the privacy of them and they are deleted uh, like after two weeks of the of rendering and after a month perm permanently deleted so only the support team has access to your files if uh, if there is some troubleshooting needed and also we have like standard NDA agreement uh, many companies uh, offer their own especially when we work for some bigger corporations, they have their own rules. So we sign NDA, uh, NDA uh, agreements and, and, and all the workers also, um, all the employees also signed the, the private NDA uh, agreement with, uh, with the company. So from the technical level, it's uh, covered and from the, from the legal uh, uh site it's also it's also covered so this is the, the files don't have a chance to leave the farm the 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 source files which you upload that's uh, really interesting that you guys are like writing and sharing uh information about this side of things because i think uh, there are a lot of people like me skeptical about these things and it's really mm. 
it's really good to know that uh, your fi your render farm respects these things and they have a clear uh, clear procedure or how it works and it's transparent to the customers that's really nice actually back in the days uh, when i started using blender and i did not have a powerful pc um i think most of the render farms were distributed render farms it's like mm -hmm. um community crowd based crowd source i think it. yeah I, I guess that one um like they distributed the files on everybody's like whoever is on there it's like a bit like torrent you have seeds and peers so somebody mm -hmm. renders and so i was more skeptical after that whole concept came in front of me so i didn't know how the other render farms work but i think i will eventually get onto some render farm uh, thing so that i can free up my main computer for other work that's really great yeah it, it depends on the on the farm really i mean the 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 how much they are prepared and then how much credible they are like yeah we, we have a uh, years of reputation and uh, so we are not like some kind of uh, ephemeric farm that just has appeared online and nobody knows where exactly it yeah. Really is. Yeah. yeah so yeah but i was i was not aware that this is such a big concern in, in terms of deciding whether using farm or not in general i really didn't did, that really surprised me that that can be yeah, that, holding on that people. that really can be uh completely my opinion and maybe mm -hmm. i'm the only one thinking this way but uh yeah that was the thing that made me not use them so much yeah because, but especially yeah that you have your own original solutions when it comes to to to, to your tools that that part it, that it, it would be important right yeah and uh also there's this other solution that people have come out with um they can uh they use the cloud processing um uh, that amazon aws mm -hmm. or google gives them and i think they there's a way to render using those but i don't know yes. about the rates or something i think it's very it's new like yeah in, 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 uh, so there's that the model infrastructure as a service where we we actually next next week we are going to have a stream about it the second time about the in general the world of cloud farming and we have some show, show some schemes and advantages and disadvantages of the various uh, of different uh, solutions so that one which you mentioned like but, but basically you you mentioned two of them one is that distributed one which we talk over and also the the Amazon and Google one, we also talk about this kind of services because they also have their advantages and their disadvantages. So next week, we we are going to have a stream. I don't know yet what's going to be the the um, the hour. If you'd like to join, and uh, and we are going to have a li live uh, uh, questions and answers. Uh, uh, to uh support wrangler so if anybody if uh if anybody would like to uh take part in that i uh invite and also if you'd like to to join yeah also invite, yeah. invite you that would be nice uh when is that is that tomorrow is that uh, ne next next, ne week. next oh. week next, next week. week uh, uh i i'm really interested to be on the monday uh, uh, on the live stream um i cannot promise right now i just need to check a few things and i will let you know right okay yeah you can always always subscribe and then you can uh just you know uh, listen to the recording and we also yeah. uh, wrote a long article about f using farms and so you you will get mail yeah i really need article. to get more familiar with your channel because i really didn't know that you you guys had uh simon thoms on which is really interesting i didn't listen to that live stream yet yeah <laughs> yeah so uh one last question i, I wanted to ask because we are already like over an, over an hour so probably we'll be wrapping up soon but uh mm -hmm. regarding sure. simon thoms and and the upcoming month that is slowly like quicker and quicker it's getting near the November. Yep. Uh, you mentioned it before, and uh, have you participated in that event? Uh, I did not participate or? last year because uh, that's the time I kind of 
came back to Blender. Like I said, yeah. uh, I dropped out of college in October. So yeah, that I couldn't participate because I didn't know anything about the whole vector system, the displacement system that was introduced. But I might uh, join this this month, this time. And I do not think I will do all the pl- all the prompts, maybe one or two, and focus on learning yeah. something new with each one. It's really hard to like keep up with the <laughs> with this curriculum yeah. of uh, yeah. each day a p- project. Like I, I tried doing Inktober a few times and really never succeeded in doing every other day. Like I, I made some, but not I every actually, thirty. I actually did uh, Inktober prompts. once. Um, back when i was not doing blender and i was a little bit stuck with studies i kind of yeah, but once you see <laughs> once yeah. you see what the guys are doing with the yeah. november <laughs> yeah. like these are crazy projects like like this this microbe for example from yeah. last year i think oh, ah, yeah it was crazy thing. stuff yeah ray marching and vector displacement at the same time yeah that was like uh, whatever simon thoms did in that november that really like opened up like this hidden like not hidden but suppressed interest that i already had about shaders and that helped me make a comeback because i saw blender become so powerful in this site oh so i just have uh, one question uh, about your works uh, do you for example there's that audio cassette and also some other um do you use any blender non photorealistic shaders or render i'm not brander users i'm not very familiar with that yeah, yeah. but they look very st- some of them look st- stylized and like yeah through to the do you use anything like that or um, just post-production i just uh make all the shaders on, on the fly so uh since now i have a bit of experience with procedural shaders and um most of the math behind it i kind of uh, if these are quick procedural shaders, then I can make them on the fly. So, so far for the sh- artworks, I have not used any external shaders or pre-made shaders. Uh, they, mm-hmm. I- they are either image textures or I make the shader myself on the fly. Uh-huh. And there's this feature in Blender called Freestyle that adds the contour lines at the in the post-production. So, that helps me give that sketchy kind of look to those uh, renders. Yeah, I was I was just thinking about this NPR rendering and uh, that thing about lines, which you said. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we talked in the last podcast about some yeah. um, non-photorealistic uh, a solution for Blender. I think yes. it was some add-on. Yeah, and you know, you know, when for example, there are a lot of people who like to like take two D into three D, like like. Uh, uh, yes. P through HD and stuff like that. And for example, I would like to take 3D into 2D. And the lines, I really don't need lines. I need <laughs> strokes of light, paint, and stuff like that. Like lines are easier to really find in 3D. So yeah, just 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 I had the thought that this is what I'm 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 looking for and there no, was that. No, that's I- interesting. I, I actually wanted to elaborate on that, like the kind of things that you feel are missing because uh, I'm thinking of making a whole uh, anime or NPR kind of solution for 3D artists. Like uh, it's the other way around. So if 3D artists want to make NPR or animate kind of stuff, it's very difficult right now. Uh, you have to do a lot of hacking. So I, I'm thinking of making something an add-on or a shader pack for that. So it would really help me if you uh, give me some inputs uh, where you think Blender is lacking right now in making this kind of work. I'm just I'm just preparing to switch to Blender from 3ds Max. So unfortunately, I cannot say about <laughs> Blender. Okay. okay. But yeah, but the recent talks with DJ podcasts, all that stuff, tutorials, just yeah, it's. Uh, it's yeah, I've seen, like, the other way. Some, t- some time ago, I've seen like materials from people working on one of the games. I don't know if it was, I think, Borderlands or something like that, where they made a whole shader system for for the whole game uh, experience, like par- partially for realistic, par- partially stylized shaders for the Border- game engine. Is the game called Borderland? Yeah, I think it was Borderlands. I think they, they were kind of like. It. 
they had a whole team working on the shaders to make this kind of a stylized, a little bit comic book style. I don't know how to how to describe it. It's yeah, yeah. like artistically very okay. interesting. There are some other games actually. I made a bookmark collection about those games, which are. Uh, have you heard about Dead Dead Static Drive? It's not yet released, I think. Dead Static Dead Drive. Not really. It's a no. um, it's a game that's in the making. I think it's being made in Unreal Engine, and I really like the shading style and the it's kind of, it's like a um, harder yeah. car car race type of game. I, like you need to take a look at it if you want to understand. It's called uh, Dead Static Static Drive. And yes, I just found it. it. Looks cool. Yeah, so I I think that's one artist work, working on it on the shaders. Uh, it's like an indie, independently released game. It's not yet released, actually. Whatever, uh, I really liked that uh, look. And the the thing with Blender is that uh, Blender is, and even other whole 3D uh, suits that come, like 3ds Max, let's say, uh, they're too complicated for this kind of work. Like, they have too much going on. For example, uh, most of the shaders in... Um, in, in NPR, non-photorealistic, cartoonish work, they do not need so much uh, light bounces or they do not need realistic shading. They need some uh, Lambert um, type of uh, Fong shading models, which is very simple to implement. But you cannot do that in Blender, like using nodes, because they have hard-coded uh, algorithms and stuff. So in games, it's easier. I, I'm not saying easier, like it's possible in games because uh, it you can make the shaders from scratch basically using OpenGL programming or things like that. So making NPR is much easier, I would say, compared, compared to Blender. So if you want to keep all the features of EV or cycles, let's say, you want to have all the features intact and still make this kind of uh, look, that makes it tricky. So So that's one thing. I think there's another project called um, Beer Blender Extended Rendering Engine or something like that. B W -E R. That's in the making. It's the open source uh, NPR render engine. I think they're making for Blender. So that might be something you guys want to look at. Mm -hmm. I was sure. thinking. I was thinking what you you asked uh, like for like only me personally like a shader that I could render some environment and. Uh, the output would be kind of like similar to ink, black and white, and a good like uh, starting point to paint in Krita, like with some ink uh, 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 brushes and stuff like that. So, like maybe not lines themselves, but just shadows and and mm. some stylized shadows and and lights, something like that. So it's mm. like. Um hatching kind of effects less less hatching more more like uh, uh i don't know this word like uh half to uh, areas of uh, like more pain paintingly like this is why i like art breeder that it creates stuff where you can find some some uh compromise between abstract and the shape and this is very inspiring to work with like uh and and it's it's not really in lines. It's rather in. Uh, I, I will check this word because uh, it's more in in, in uh, like spots, stains, stuff like that. Like this kind of shader would be cool. I'm looking up Art Breeder right now because I haven't really seen it yet. I have seen other style transfer algorithms. I don't think it's style style transfer. Is it? No, no, it's, it's rather like uh, coming up with concepts of characters or stuff uh, Whoa, based on like... This is well, there's interesting a, there's stuff. A, mm -hmm. There is a style transfer there, but it's much wider yeah. thing than just one style. Yeah, you, I can you see can, that. Yeah, You can borrow the style really easily and actually also on the way borrow some features of other image, which is not like a uh, good part, but... There's so much like there, you know, those volume knobs there that you can basically copy the style 
borrow the style of of something. So yeah, it's a, and it's 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 just vol, you know uh uh playing up with with volume knobs which is kind of like procedural uh shading yeah which for example i like this this way of working it really looks so, interesting i haven't heard of, of it yet somehow but this is not style transfer like primitive trans at least it's pretty advanced as yeah. i can see yeah it's, uh, it has a growing uh, base of experience of of choices of artists so is this open source so yeah, yeah. or is it like a uh, yes it is it, yeah it is you know it is open source and it's on github as far as i know but i don't know if it works in any other way than with connection to their server there's like this is like a bigger project but it's open oh, source i see i see just yeah because i was worried about the the you know the licensing stuff and um of the output and mm-hmm. in general right. get the license yeah so i was thinking can i do it more private like compile my own version stuff like that is there a but, uh, uh, github for it uh, yes it's yeah, there is github for it I, I think in the if you scroll down on the website there's all the information and there's also a link to link to github yeah, is it so. is it that gan breeder by Joel Simon, is it the one? Uh, yeah, it, it, it was. Uh, I don't remember exactly, but this is like the it it that thing had some previous more uh, limited I see, versions. I see, I see. You know? Like uh, Art Builder is kind of closed source right now, but they had a more primitive version, better version that was that's up on GitHub, right? Oh yeah, uh, as far as I could understand it, because you mm. know I'm not a coder. Or programmers, yeah. so uh, there's another project called Deoldify. You have heard about it? You, you Deoldify. Can, Deoldify. You, yeah, you can turn uh, and no. restore old photos into like you can colorize black and white images basically. And yeah, wow. they had a uh, they had it open sourced to one point. Then after that, all the advanced features are now closed source, and you still have the open source version. So I think something similar is done here. Hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, I see a lot of potential with this AI uh, stuff in this creative field. I I think, uh, like I like I said on my podcast once, um, I think instead of being scared of the AI, I think we will all start individually start making full feature length movies at one point, and it will just yeah. improve the quality of work if each and every individual does and. It will make the whole movie market open instead of just big studios being able to make movies. I think so. That would be an interesting yeah, I, way. I, you know, you know what? When, when I look at the art breeder, I can see that you can like basically take out from there like a very like a hitting image just out of the nowhere, like yeah. some even abstract stuff. And uh, if this is going to grow and used in all other techniques. I think there will be a lot of more interesting ideas out there with with the with the looks with the um anything so yeah it's it's not automation of the repetitive part but more quality stuff i think there it will be easy to to yeah to, basically you know. oh, at one point we will have like a um uh, whole suit of ai programs available that you can do some part of like that can completely take over your workflow and some people think that it will take over their job but i do not tend to think in that way i think like we will all have the opportunity to uh share movies or even bigger projects sitting at home using this as our using them as our maybe artists at studio or employees yeah, yeah, so like interesting times ahead probably for us. Yeah, yeah. artists don't artists uh, will less often get high and will quit drugs, but <laughs> will start cooperating <laughs> with AI. Uh, yeah, everybody will be healthier and the, the same creative. As, yeah, you yeah. know, or, Let's or just like get get future. or get more backache, <laughs> <or> something <laughs> like that. For from sitting in front of the computers too long. <laughs> uh, 
anyways, I'm, I was super, it was a super nice conversation, Cheyenne. So it was awesome. Yeah. We yeah. are really glad for having you with us today. Thank you. And, Thank you uh, for inviting me. We're hoping our uh, small but growing audience will also check out your channels, your podcasts. We, we hope that you will also return to podcasting. So yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe in the yeah. future we can, we can appear yeah. as guests there. <laughs> Why not? That would be great, actually. I was thinking of bringing on guests uh, at one point. Yeah. So, so definitely, guys listening to that, check out Blue Inversion. And, and the uh, links to the to Cheyenne's all web pages and uh, channels there are going to be added under the YouTube video. Thank you so much, guys. Yeah, it was a really, really great uh, episode, and having somebody um, from the same field and being able to talk uh, an hour or so on that is really great because kind of uh, I I'm in such a place that I don't really find too many like-minded people. And it was really a relief to have a such depth, in-depth conversation about everything that I do. That's really, I'm really yeah. humbled and honored for that. As, especially for the Blender users with, with the lack of Blender conference this year. So yeah, the opportunity this year. In Amsterdam. This year they didn't even have the yeah. conference, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's just like some kind of like online comforting yeah. event or so. It's, that's not the same. Anyway, yeah. So, see you around. Yeah, thank Listeners. you guys, and, and hear hear you again soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.